are you like advocating that we like do like a certain diet or do you think that some diet would be more optimal than what we eat now or what's sort of, yeah, I guess what I'm. Yeah. So if, if we look at these people, they were free of any degenerative disease. So if we talk about obesity, heart disease, um, any cardiovascular related diseases, um, pretty much anything, uh, I mean, sort of, wait, 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 you're telling me that all indigenous people were free of things like heart disease? Before modern foods, yes. Uh, I'm, and even in cases of, uh, it's interesting. If you look at, I have a couple of studies on the Maasai and is that atherosclerosis, the buildup of plaque in the arteries is, there's a big difference between actual arteries and the inflammation caused by cardiac events. So when we look at these Maasai, these people that subsisted off of blood, meat, and milk, uh, they were actually immune in a way to the disease. Wait, let me just, I'm, let me yeah, I'm really curious. Can you, can you link me for, to see that, uh, people didn't get things like heart disease before, um, I guess before like modern day nutrition was invented. I mean, or? that's not something you're going to, that's not, I mean, that's not going to be something you're going to be able to read in a, a short period. I can link you the, I can link you a big text. Let's see if I could find the specific. And let me let me just go grab the sorry I didn't prepare this beforehand. Let me just grab the studies on the on the Maasai that I had. At that book that I linked, I mean that's not gonna be something you're gonna be able to look at uh quickly. There's just you know, it's hundreds of pages. Yeah. This is one study on the Maasai. Goes summary investigation of 400 Maasai men and number of women and children showed little or no clinical or chemical signs of atherosclerosis. Despite a long continuous diet of only meat and milk, men have low serum cholesterol levels and no signs of arteriosclerotic heart disease. The common understanding that animal fats cause coronary disease has been investigated. We're, we're talking specifically about degenerative disease. You know, we're not talking about like uh, literally almost all of the Native Americans got wiped out from smallpox. Mm -hmm. Specifically referring to is anything that's kind of related to like such as cancer, disease, obesity, diabetes, all of these things uh, were absent when they were on there. Do you think that, like, um, don't you think you could achieve, like, similar outcomes using things like ketogenic diets, though, instead of just going, like, full meat-only diet, or? Oh, well, the, you know, the reason I reached out to you wasn't really specifically to talk about a meat-only diet. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was to talk about the base nutrient density that these animal foods offered. So if we actually look at, and uh, let me get the course for this real quick. If we actually look at hunter-gatherer macronutrient ratios in their diets, uh, approximately like 65 to 75, uh, 65 to 70 percent of the calories foods. So every indigenous group consumed quite a variety of plant foods in most cases. In the case of like the indigenous Aborigines, they would literally have access to hundreds to thousands of wild plant foods just in their native habitat. So a few indigenous groups that subsisted entirely off of meat and uh, and the big thing to keep in mind is that every food in every case was eaten out of necessity. You know, these people had to survive. So, you know, that we might see certain groups of Native Americans that subsisted mostly off of buffalo, and they might have gotten 80 to 90 percent of their calories from buffalo. But then we might look at a group of Swiss people in um, that are living. And these Swiss people might have had you know, 60% of their calories from just cheese and then the rest of their calories from rye bread. Mm -hmm. Variance in all of these indigenous diets, but the one common factor is the presence of high quality animal foods. That's the, that's the kind of thing to take away from, from this. And if we do look at a ketogenic diet, diet doesn't really focus on the nutrient content of the foods. It's, it's kind of difficult to correlate. I mean, 
in a way, would following a ketogenic diet achieve macronutrient ratios that some of these hunter gatherers are following? Possibly. Well, I guess like but, the reason why I ask is I'm looking at things that are related to, um, especially when you talk about things like obesity and diabetes. It seems like controlling your intake of sugar is really what's going on here. They're just eating meat isn't conferring you some protection, some mystical protection against like diabetes or obesity, but but more if you're only eating meats or even meats and vegetables, the amount of sugar that you're intaking is dramatically decreasing. Uh, and I feel like that would be like a huge explanatory thing there as well. No. I mean, if we're just if we're just talking about the preventing degenerative disease, and and we look at a ketogenic diet, and yeah, I mean, there is plenty of evidence of that reversing diabetes in a lot of people. That is certain. That's certain. And the the high carbohydrate intake, the refined carbohydrate intake, the sugar intake, contribute to. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Your mic keeps cutting out. I don't know if you're using push to talk, but like every now and then, I'll lose like two words out of a sentence. Is this better? I'll just talk a little louder. Sure, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you. If it I'm, cuts I'm out sorry. Again. I'm using a I'm using a dynamic microphone. So yeah, that's fine. Just make sure to keep my voice at the same level. Yeah, yeah, I got it. But I just linked one study that showed uh, just the macronutrient ratios, and the other study that showed hunter gatherer diets uh, meat based yet to heart disease. Ketogenic diet in regards to diabetes, a lot of diseases. That's one element of diet. That's removing well, like, inflammation. Yeah, so here's kind of the pr problems that I have. So like when you write here, like the paradoxical nature of hunter-gatherer diets, meat-based yet non-anthrogenic, um, um, where does anthrogenic mean damaging to the heart? Let me, what does this word yes, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah tending to promote the formation like, of fatty yeah. plaques in the arteries. Okay. Um, wh what I'm wondering is that like um, if you look at hunter-gatherer lifestyles, these are people that pr were probably far, far, far more physically active than what we are today. Um, I feel like there are so many more variables here than just diet that might be impacting. Like, sure, maybe the diet is helping too, but wouldn't the immense amount of physical activity help as well? First, but the main correlation that I would wanted to make with the, the nutrient density of this diet was mainly if you look at the facial structure, if we look at the height, you know, if we look at their lack of need for glasses or braces, uh, glaring thing that stuck out to me. And uh, I mean, you could even Google like Native American eyesight or sight. And these, these people, these Native Americans that are only, you know, several generations off their indigenous diet and these Aborigines that are only one or two generations off their indigenous diet. Such incredible eyesight. I mean, the, they used to recruit the Aborigines for the Navy and because they would be literally be able to see ships that were miles away. Wait, so you think that, um, you think that having a meat only diet is helping these people with their eyesight or their current eyesight? No, I, I think the incredibly high retinoic acid content of the animal foods in these diet is necessary for optimal human physical development. Has and has this been demonstrated with the study or anything or only demonstration and the only data that i have uh that it's not really there's nothing showing that you know one if for humans there is a study called the pottinger cat study cats did go sterile after being fed several generations of a cooked meat diet as opposed to a raw meat diet and it did show the effects of ancient nutrient profile. Wait, wait, for cats? Cats, though. Oh, wait, hold on, I'm sorry, your mic keeps cutting out. When I ask you to repeat, it's just because your mic keeps cutting out. So, so wait, I didn't hear that again. Did you say for this was for cats? There's one study called the Pottinger Cat Study where they fed cats a cooked meat diet. And yeah, within... so the, the, my, my only problem here, and I'm not trying to be too picky because um, animal testing is very fucking important for this type of stuff. I totally recognize that. But when we're talking about things like health and diet, um, cats are obligate carnivores. They're, I feel like their digestive tract is going to be much different than ours with the way that they um, with the way that they, they digest and integrate different vitamins and shit into their body. Um, like humans can theoretically live, well, not theoretically, we can live without eating meat at all. Cats, if they don't eat meat, will die. Uh, are these digestive tracts really comparable? I mean, if we do want to look at the digestive tract of a human and compare it to any animal in particular, it is closest to that of a wolf. So in regards to the acidity of the stomach, the length of the small intestine, the lack of fermentation chambers in the gut, the lack of bacteria that ferments fatty acids, uh, 
if you look at the human digestive tract, it is meant to synthesize nutrients from animal foods. The, the only correlation I have between facial development and structure and all of those things is specifically really looking at these indigenous groups of people and their facial development, their height, their absence of degenerative disease, and then correlating that with the animal foods in yeah. their diet. Okay, okay, yeah. Hold on. Okay, so because we keep like lumping in like a ton of things together and then kind of like moving past it, but I'm, I'm kind of interested in each of these individual things. So like when, when you talk about things like eyesight or you talk about things like height, um, I've, I've never heard this. So my understanding of how height works in a human is that height is something that is largely genetically determined, that you have a capacity to reach a certain height and that things like um, like like you're, you've got growth plates that are more or less genetically predetermined. And as long as you receive the proper amount of nutrients, um, you'll grow to a certain height, whatever you're, you're going to. And then your growth plates close and then that's it. Um, are you okay. are you making the claim that like if you eat like a certain diet that people will necessarily be taller, that that's like a thing that is true? Oh, or? I guess I guess I would to, to answer that, I would ask a question. I would mm -hmm. say, OK, well, why do you think Italians are short and why do you think Dutch people are tall? Is it genetics or does something determine genetics over generations? Um, I mean, that could be an, an incredibly complicated question. I mean, I, I mean, there, there could be a, a large number of genetic factors that play into it. There could have been environmental pressures at one point in time that influenced this genetic factor. Um, I'm not sure. Are you saying that it was solely diet or? And if we look at the amount of animal foods and grains in the diet of Italians over the past thousands of years, the grains is substantially higher than the Dutch. If you look at the diet of the people, the Dutch people in the Netherlands, well, pretty much the tallest country in the world, they have a very high intake of animal foods in the diet. Yeah, sure. But like I could. So without the problem, without having like studies or the problem without having like a causal. Well, one, like some sort of study that highly correlates it. And then two, like a biological mechanism that describes why this would take place is that I could propose hypotheses for why um, this may or may not be true. So, for instance, let's say that in a vacuum, a short person will, will outlive a long person because a short person needs to consume less calories to survive. So the long person is at a disadvantage there in an environment for being able to survive and reproduce. Now, let's say that that long person or, or let's say that a taller person is is able to um, exist only because being tall allows them to hunt down certain forms of animals, right? And if they were shorter, they either wouldn't have the um, the, the leg, uh, right, the ability to run long distances or hunt animals, right? So, like, I could take two populations that grow entirely uh, apart from one another, where one people tend to eat plants and another people tend to eat animals, and the people that eat animals might be taller slightly because that's the trait that's selected for when it comes to hunting, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're healthier or better off for it. They just happen to be taller because they're more suited for that, right? But that And that also doesn't necessarily mean that eating that food enabled them to grow taller. That just might have been the trait that was selected for, right? I'm not saying that I'm correct. I'm just saying that that could be a possible explanation. W wouldn't you need, like, a causal mechanism to explain one over the other you could say that but it, it's if it's like a plant if a plant doesn't have the right nutrients in the soil to grow it's not going to achieve its its growth potential say that almost everyone nowadays does not achieve adequate yeah so of like that should be able if that's true that should be demonstrated that people um should be able to grow taller that that should be pretty easy to demonstrate no like uh, malnutrition and not growing to your um theoretical height as a result of malnutrition should be something that's pretty easy to demonstrate there's a big difference between malnutrition and optimal nutrition i mean in you know what people think is average and what people think is optimal for sure I mean, I guess like, I feel like we're taking, I feel like this is even like a really socially loaded question too, because the idea that being really tall is optimal, that's not even necessarily true. Like again, like larger calorie consuming things tend to live less longer and need to gather more energy in order to survive. These are, I would consider these suboptimal traits for survival in like a, like a- From the perspective of hunters, uh, being taller was a desirable trait. Uh, I mean, you could cover more ground taller and they have more bone density and muscle mass they're stronger they're able to yeah to hunt I, yeah, better I, yeah i agree with what you're saying here but this is kind of so showing my point like again like having greater muscle density this is a negative when it comes to survival this is why humans don't don't naturally come with a ton of muscle right because we don't want to carry extra muscle if we don't need to so having to carry more muscle in order to be able to hunt animals it seems to be the other way around then that the reason why these people are taller or maybe stronger is because they needed to be in order to capture food whereas if you're farming or living a more uh plant-based life you, you don't need that much energy no no but it correlates directly with the percentage of animal foods present in the diet, because if there are animal foods present in the diet, 
you know, the body is able to grow to its optimal height because of the protein, the fat type of vitamins. But if not a high percentage of plant food, it's, if it's not a high percentage of animal foods, then there's going to be some sort of bottleneck on their height. And yeah, this that, might and not. That's, and I agree with what you're saying there, but. Or, or I'm sorry, if I were to agree with what you're saying there, that I feel Steve. like you should be able to demonstrate that. There should be like some study or something showing that. I did. I was just looking for a study. I did okay, just yeah. link one. It's child height gain is associated with consumption of animal source foods in livestock owning households in Western Kenya. Okay, but in Western Kenya, are we talking malnutrition here? Like, um, oh, well, I, we can actually kind of like read this really quickly, I guess. Uh, I, I'm just reading through it real quick. You're going to look to, I haven't, uh, I haven't gone through in this one before. Let me see if I can find another one on dairy association. So this is among children of less than of over six months old reported frequency of egg and milk consumption was associated with increased monthly height gain. Poultry ownership was associated with, with higher reported frequency of egg, milk and chicken consumption. Some livestock diseases were associated with lower. No, no, no. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious if this is, um, we conducted a longitudinal cohort study of anthro, anthropo, anthropometry and 3d feeding recalls among children in addition we collect data on wealth livestock ownership and livestock disease and somehow we use linear Oh, okay, hold on. This one you linked is interesting. Okay, little is, is known yeah, about how cow's milk consumption affects growth of young children. The consumption of milk, but not other dairy products, is associated with height among U.S. preschool students. Sample of 1,002 children aged 24 to 59 months used multivariate regression tested for associations between milk consumption and height controlling age. Results, children in the highest quartile of milk intake were taller than those in Q2 and Q3, but not Q1. Um, okay. Um, total calcium had a positive effect on height, but did not change the height differences among percentiles. Total protein was not associated with height, and Q4 children were taller than those in other quartiles. Children who drank milk daily were taller than those with less frequent intake. Consumption of other dairy products had no association with height. Blacks were taller than whites, and Mexican-Americans controlling for milk intake did not alter this pattern. Okay, so this seems to... Um, uh, I, I think this like this is evidence that drinking milk at the very least could cause you to grow a little bit taller. Sure. Here's uh here's another study mm -hmm. that's on the birth correlating with uh height, IQ, I believe, educational attainment, and the reason we're looking at the the month that the child is born and is because. In nature, what would have happened is spring and the summer brings grass and food and the ruminant animals uh, become fat. And this is when humans kind of have their prime hunting period in, in the late summer and fall. So mm -hmm. the idea is that humans would have procured nutrition from these animals in the summer and fall. They would have gotten pregnant and then given birth in the spring and the summer months. And the reason it's important that they give birth in the spring and the summer months is because levels in the body, you know, you can only store enough vitamin D3 for one winter. Um, and the, the scale of storing vitamin D3, if you're below 40 nanograms per milliliter, your body's pretty much running on empty. It's using whatever vitamin D3 it can get. Mm -hmm. Once the amount of vitamin D3 is past 40 nanograms per milliliter, your body starts storing it for the winter. And once you're above 60, it's deemed kind of that your body has adequate D3 stores for the winter. Over 70, 75 is ideal. The numbers I got this from were from a, it was a study on indigenous peoples living in, I believe some, like an Arctic Russian climate. And it, the reason I use them as a, a demonstration is because it's pretty much the minimal amount of vitamin D3 as they are not in a sunny area. Mm -hmm. Find this, but, uh, the, the important thing is that, and I'm going to link some 
to video I did, and it just has a bunch of studies in the in the des description of the video, is the vitamin levels in mother's breast milk vary drastically. Levels in breast milk can vary from 0.05% to 0.73%. So that's almost a 20-fold variance in A levels. And not only does this apply to breast milk, this applies to uh, all the vitamins, all the fat-soluble vitamins, all the B, all the B vitamins, all the K vitamins. It, it's hard to really problem with like this whole idea that I have is that there's a lot of bits and pieces of information that you can't really, you know, show a concrete patient as opposed to, uh, you know, things that you're kind of piecing together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just it's scary because like if you're not careful, like anybody can weave together any story. Um, and it seems like when it comes to biology, like everything is like biology is very, very soft in terms of its scientific claims uh, when it comes to diet and whatnot, because it's so hard to understand everything is linked together. So I just get kind of worried when somebody has uh, I don't know how far you take it. I haven't watched all of your channel, but I know like people like um, Peterson's daughter, Jordan Peterson's daughter will say things like an all meat diet can help you cure like every disease you have. Oh, listen, listen, listen. She is uh -huh. a complete. And I mean to be, I mean to say this in the nicest way. She's a bit of a ditzy moron in regards to this diet. And, you know, the difference between, you know, she eats ribeye steak all day. I'm eating pretty much every part of the animal, a very yeah, high wild. Yeah, we watched a video of you eating like cat brains and liver and whatnot. So. That's, that's, a, cow, yeah, that's cow a little, brains. yeah. But uh, j just to, mm -hmm. if you want to actually look at, vi like, I think anyone would agree that if you don't have a proper a proper mineral and um, what are the what are the key vitamins that plants need to grow? I think it's potassium, nitrogen, and I can't remember. But uh, nitrogen, potassium, uh, plants need three. Let me just look it up real quick. Fertilizer. So plants need nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to grow. Uh, as a minimum in the soil. And uh, they call these fertilizers NPK fertilizers. These are like carbs, fats, and proteins. Mm -hmm. And you're pretty much giving the plant macronutrients to grow. You're not giving Now, you're not giving the plant micronutrients. You're not giving it um, all the minerals. You're not giving it all the other vitamins, vitamin K, vitamin uh, carotenoids. You're not giving the plant the other vitamins that will increase the vitamin concentration in the food. So if we look at, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard like they add pigmentation to farm salmon because the farmed salmon don't get the orange color because they don't have the carotenoids present in their diet. Sure. If, if an animal or a plant does not have the required nutrients in the soil, in the diet, if they're not eating the proper foods, their tissue isn't going to be reflective of the vitamins themselves. It applies to humans too. So if we look at, for plants is simple because what happens if a plant doesn't get enough nutrients it, you know just doesn't it doesn't grow it dies it doesn't grow optimally nutrients that humans need and to me if you know if i asked someone what a healthy diet meant i mean i'm hoping part of their answer would be the vitamin and mineral content of the diet at least to some degree because if the vitamin and mineral content of the diet isn't the most important thing in the diet then what is you know, if your vitamin D3 intake, if your omega-3 fatty acid intake, if those things aren't the most important part of the diet, then I'd have to ask what is. Mm -hmm. So then if we actually look at those vitamins individually, the vitamin versions of the plant and the animal form, uh, vitamin A, for example, vitamin A in plant foods occurs as carotenoids and limited conversion rates in the body. Uh, not only are the conversion rates limited and... Uh, you know, they only convert at usually fruits are around 14 to one. Yeah, yeah, wait, wait, so, so what are we moving towards? You're essentially saying that you think we can get most of these from, from meaty things or what, I, what I'm saying is the, the forms of vitamins in plants are not, we can't assimilate enough nutrition from them to be an optimal health. I'm getting at. So if you take, you know, you can eat all the carrots you want, but your body can only convert a certain amount of carotenoids to retinoic acid. And even in that case, some people have uh, genetic polymorphisms where they can't convert carotenoids to retinoic acid. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty large percentage of the population, actually. Wait, um, is that You know, true? vitamin K2. Good link on that. Uh, give me a second. Sure.
uh, I think this was in the a lot of this like that that video I linked to carnivore versus vegan nutrients. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind of going over a lot of what was in that video. Okay, so this is the, the study on carotenoid conversion to vitamin A. And the important thing, the main thing to note here is part of the study. Wait, are you still here? I'm here. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so what happened was they fed subjects six milligrams of carotene and oil, and the conversion factor was 3.8 to 1, which is pretty good, you know, 4 to 1. It's a dosage to 126 milligrams of carotene and oil. The conversion factor went up to 55 to 1. And this does Wait, when talk they did, about... When they did what, it went up to 55 to 1? They increased the dosage by about 25 times of carotene and oil. Okay. So when they tried to administer higher doses of the vitamin, the conversion rate lowered drastically. Uh, oh, sure, tenfold. sure. Okay, yeah, I'm familiar with them. So bioavailability, we're talking about the ability to... Like, if you consume, like, 10,000 uh, fucking grams of protein, you're not you're not going to get all of that. Most of that is going to be... Yeah, yeah, of course, but this is different in a sense that uh, use higher amounts of vitamin A for processes and store it, but it just... The, the plant version, you can't achieve optimal levels for it. And if we if you scroll down in the study right before conclusions... Uh, it says, we have observed large variations in the bioconversion of dietary carotene to vitamin A, which may be related to the genetic characteristics of the subjects. Because the enzyme responsible for beta carotene conversion into retinol is B carotene 15, 15, mox, uh, some scientific stuff. Genetic polymorphisms in the gene may contribute to the poor converter phenotype. Reported that two common non synonymous single nucleotide polymorphisms have been identified and in vitro biochemical characterization of blah, blah, blah. Response of this, uh, it basically shows their ability is a, it decreases 69% to convert carotene uh, into uh, retinol acid. And that's why some people turn orange, and that's also why some people do far worse on a vegan diet than others. Mm -hmm. Large percentage of the population. Uh, I don't know, remember where I found the statistics on that, but I think it was up to 40% of the population had a, a, a highly impaired and the reason this vitamin uh, is so important, specifically vitamin A, retinoic acid, is because it's in the creation of every cell. So, you know, cell differentiation, what, you know, cells your body chooses to make is regulated by gene expression, which needs, I guess it is a precursor to that entire process. Arguably say that every cell in the body and uh, if whether or not your body has the optimal fuel to make it by vitamin A and the only way to really get a considerable amount of vitamin A is in the form of retinoic acid, which only occurs in animal products. Gotcha. That's interesting. This is why the fish oil um, capsules are so recommended. Oh, uh, well, well, fish oil is omega-3, but cod liver oil, um, well, li liver is the only animal food that's abundant in vitamin A. Uh -huh. And uh, did you ever hear of like uh, the orcas were killing sharks and eating their liver? Um, I, no, but what about it? Orcas are killing great white sharks and eating their livers. Uh, so uh, th this is one example in nature of preference for organs. And the liver of the shark has a very high vitamin A concentration. So specifically cons killing sharks and consuming their liver for the nutrition that was in the liver. Mm -hmm. Look at an animals in nature that kill. Uh, they, they usually go for the guts first where the organs are, where the nutrition is. 
even I even have like a compilation of clips of certain herbivorous animals, unquote, eating meat if available. Like deer eating birds, uh monkeys eating meat. Uh there's a lot of preference for uh there's a book called and then I can link it to you busy or I'm assuming I don't I don't even have time to read stuff myself let alone yeah that's fine you are but uh there's this book called the fat of the land uh and it's Bob the armor Stephenson who's an arctic explorer and this was back in the 1900s and they threw him in a hospital after because what happened was he came back from these arctic expeditions he claimed that he survived for only I think it was a couple of years on an all-meat diet and they're like oh no you would have died you would have gotten scurvy so they put this guy into a hospital for like a year and they made him only eat meat. Uh, but the main part of this book, referencing it now, is because these indigenous people had very specific preferences for parts of the animal and what they would do with them. Mm -hmm. Sorry, real quick. So someone in chat yeah. said, did that retard say that vitamin A is only in vitamin in animal products? It's bullshit. Call him out on that, please. Don't listen to him at all. So you're, what you're saying is essentially is that vitamin A um, exists in, I think you acknowledge that it exists in vegetables, but what you're saying is that the bioavailability of Carrots those foods form. is not so, great? The of the USDA mm -hmm. to label vitamin A is, is a bit bullshit. So if a food has beta carotene in it, they can label it as vitamin A on the label of the food. But that's not actually correct because food has vitamin A in the carotenoid form, not the retinoic acid form. And the carotenoid form needs that um, that one well, thing needs, in order to convert one, it or whatever, right? One, it, it needs fat to be converted. Mm -hmm. And you're, you have to have the genetic predisposition to be good at converting it. And the main contradictory thing is, okay, if you need fat to convert beta carotene into retinoic acid, going to get fat in all parts of the world at all climates at all points in time you know the only access to fat would be from animal foods and i mean to get fat from a plant food in, in most parts of the world is uh it's not accessible mm -hmm. all right tropical and warm climates well, what else did you want to talk about or what else what else do you got for us I mean, this is the main premise of uh, the idea that if we consumed, uh, you know, just the overall nutrient density of these animal foods, if we consume them, we would be in optimal health. But all it's, you know, if you look in nature, you know, do wolves have crooked teeth or wolves wearing glasses? And sound kind of crazy but well, so like, i don't yeah, believe yeah. I, so i'm okay with the dietary claims um i did a little bit of research before i had this conversation and it seems like most of what you're saying uh, appears to be lining up with with what I've, I've heard and i haven't heard you say anything too contradictory but when you start my worry is when you move from like making pretty basic dietary claims like for instance bioavailability of vitamins in, in certain foods to saying things like wolves have good eyesight so our eyesight problems are caused by not eating certain foods i don't know if that's that's, I mean, that's not really what I was getting at. What I was, uh -huh. what I was saying was, animals in nature on their on their diets that they normally eat don't have these problems that we're having. I don't even know if that's true, though. Like, had, um, one, I, I don't know how. Um, I don't know if the measure for human eyesight is accurate. For instance, is twenty twenty vision is that truly average vision, or does that need to be changed? Um, and, and then two, I don't know if the um. I don't know if like if humans need optimal eyesight in the same way that that wolves do. If that's even like a thing that's necessarily like, um, like like if that's a trait that's as highly selected for as it is in wolves. So for instance, like looking at like certain humans and going, well, look, some humans are very hairy and they're very healthy because that like bears are they can survive in cold climates like bears could. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I'm sure that bears select for thick fur or you know, I think that that selection is probably a lot more important than than humans having thick hair. I I just don't know if eyesight it, like saying that if we just eat like the right diet, our eyesight would all be perfect. The correlation wasn't going to be towards wolves. It, it was just I was just kind of mentioning that. I mean. You know, we have people in our modern society, I'm sure everyone knows people who wear glasses mm -hmm. and people who have perfect 2020 vision. I'm sure people know that, you know, people that have needed braces two or three times born with perfectly straight teeth. This is not 
yeah, and and people and a lot of the things that people like to correlate to genetics, my belief is that it's of vitamins throughout developmental periods, especially during pregnancy, prenatal periods, nursing. I linked I linked that video earlier that had the studies showing that there's a big variance in various vitamins and DHA levels in mother's breast milk, and uh, you know you know I mean I can't really mm-hmm. convince people without you know obviously because there's no like I could say okay when they analyzed skulls of Eskimo of Eskimos and Inuit people the skulls had perfect proportions they had perfect teeth they had no signs of dental cavities they had none of those things. And then I could say, okay, now we have these problems. And then we say, all right, what's the difference in lifestyle? It's the diet, it's the sun exposure, it's all of these things. All of this data that I've been giving you is kind of, I mean, I don't know where you want me to specifically like try to point you to more studies and they died at birth. Uh, For the person that says uh, in the chat, because they died at birth, in the name uh, of the, the reason Senate of the Republic, you are. It was so high in certain indigenous groups, uh, and that once they passed a certain age, much longer was because of the lack of these vitamins during the developmental periods, as necessary past a certain age. Once your body was developed. Please make this guy stop. Oh, that's a true point as well, that animals that would have health problems in nature would just die, so we wouldn't see them as often as well, maybe. But, um... Yeah, I guess, um... I'm just not sure how much of our problems are caused today by, like, by... It seems like... Like, sugar-related stuff. I mean, I don't think I necessarily disagree with most of your broader points, though. Oh, I mean... Over this conversation, the things I brought up were... Mm -hmm. Okay, indigenous groups consumed these animal foods in their diet Mm -hmm. and have certain forms of these vitamins in forms that are more available to the human body. Mm -hmm. That's my first point. And I don't think there's any, anything refuting that. Yeah, probably again, I just get very cautious, like correlating like conditions of older people to current people when the lifestyle changes are so dramatically different as well. Oh, it's, it's very difficult to prove because I mean, one, we don't really have a lot of data on these groups of people. And, you know, even if I can establish that, okay, you know, these people consume these vitamins in in these animal forms, it's very apparent that they didn't have some problems that we have now putting two and two together and actually saying, okay, well, I mean, we we could look at babies fed, uh, you know, babies that are breastfed versus babies that are formula fed. Let me see if I could find something on that real quick. Breastfed versus what? A formula fed. What what's your claim? I'm assuming it's going to be correlated with looking for correlation with higher IQ and birth weight. Oh yeah, I don't need but, to. You don't need to show me that. Um, the correlation between IQ and, and like breastfeed, I'm aware of those. That's like very very very. Yeah, I mean, high. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to me, if if we can understand that, have these vitamins in more available forms require vitamins to grow optimally mm-hmm. the the difficult thing to prove is that if you were to give someone more of these vitamins if it would actually correlate to yeah that would be that's taller. kind of like that's the difficult correlation that's kind of make. the interesting thing that i'm aware of is like taking a study group of maybe like um i don't know maybe like 100 people and having like 20 of them go to a keto diet 20 of them go to a meat only diet 20 of them do whatever and then to do like a it sucks but you have to do like a longitudinal like over like a course of a year to, to monitor health benefits and see what changes like not changing any not making any of the lifestyle choice changes is what i'd be really curious to see um that's obviously like a huge burden because i don't know how much interest there even is in investigating even on popular diets it's hard to find data sometimes like ketogenic diets and stuff um so for more obscure diets it would be even more difficult yeah but um let me look at let me just look at this study mm-hmm. uh breastfed infants vitamin k i mean you know i could i could really beat this to death and and show that nutrient deficiencies in in modern diets, especially, comp- I I just really don't know where to go with this because thing is modern diets are lacking these vitamins. 
Yeah, I just don't know if it, if they're lacking these vitamins because we have um because we're not exclusively eating meat or just because modern diets are super shit. You know, if you look at uh, if you look at the nutrient profile of a ruminant animal, the muscle meat and the fat. Uh, well, the muscle meat in particular doesn't really contain a lot of nutrition. Uh, I mean, in the case of wild caught fish, if you try to compare like ribeye steak, you know, it's a world of a difference in omega three fatty acid content. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just eating meat in general, vastly different nutritional profile than foods like liver, brain tissue, bone marrow, kidneys. You can obtain complete nutrition profiles from uh, consuming certain animal foods. Just only eating meat is drastically different. Sure. All right. Well, hey, anything else for us? In... I kind of touched on all the points I wanted to. I mean, it doesn't seem doesn't seem like it's it's too convincing. <laughs> well, no, I no, mean, it's not. It's not. I mean, it's not like. Um, I mean, there are some things that I know to be true. I mean, honestly, you haven't said anything that I don't necessarily disagree with. Um, like when I look at it, the thing is, that just like I'm, I'm thinking prescriptively is usually how I think of these things. Like, what can we tell people to do? So on the surface, like all meat diets are never going to happen because it's totally unsustainable. That's impossible. Um, so what I'm interested in is like how much of what you're saying is related to like an all meat diet versus other factors, and what what I feel like. And when I say feel, this is my intuitive feeling based on kind of like studies I've read and whatnot. And, and maybe you'll even agree with this. I feel like um, of, of all the benefits you're talking about, I feel like we could get like 90% of these benefits by cutting out most sugars and increasing the amount of physical exercise we get. And that a lot of other things would kind of fall into play from there. That maybe there are some benefits, maybe some things to be researched or discovered past that. Um, but like going to the, to the point of doing like an all meat diet seems like a really extreme move that one is totally unsustainable Two, most people would never even do. And then three, I don't think is necessary to get like the majority of the benefits you would from, from radically changing your diet and the amount of exercise you get every day. That's kind of, that's just kind of like my gut feeling on that. Um, you think that a lot of the modern problems are more related to negative things in the diet as opposed to a lack of nutrition in the diet? Um, I feel like, I, so the two, I think that the two most neglected things we have today are diet and exercise and in, in, the, in the kind of the Western world, um, in that. But but so like I think that the exercise probably plays a big role in it. Fucking exercise impacts so much fucking shit in our lives, um, from hormone production to quality of sleep we get to likelihood of depression. Like there's so much shit that ties into the amount of exercise we get. And I'm sure that like exercising at an early age is going to have a huge impact on a lot of developmental stuff as well. Um, so I, I mean, like, I, I mean, the exercise part is probably really fucking important, too. That's why I kind of keep pointing back when we talk about like um, when we try to compare ourselves to older people. I'm sure that the amount of daily activity they got had a massive impact on the way that they grew up as well. Not not just the food they ate. But then also in terms of food, like we do so much shit. It's kind of like saying like, I think that, or well, I'm not trying to start in your position, but like we, we eat so fucking horribly today. I don't think that we need to do dramatic changes to our diet to have a much better diet, but things that like cutting out like most sugars, like everything we eat is so fucking sugary and so low in nutrients today that I don't know if we necessarily need to go to like an all meat diet to get most of these, um, to get most of the benefits that you're kind of talking about. That's That's kind of like my gut feeling on that. Um, I'm not necessarily advocating uh, uh -huh. an only meat diet. I'm advocating for a, a base amount of nutrient density in the diet. Yeah. Think for. Which but, is, I think, uh, like even the FDA like advocates for that. But how many people like actually like follow even those guidelines that I think some people would say are inadequate? Like, I don't even know if those guidelines are traditionally followed by most Americans. Like our sugar intake but if, is way if you look at if you look at the RDAs mm -hmm. and you look at the magnesium RDA, it's 400 milligrams. Uh, is it 400 milligrams? Yeah, 400 milligrams RDA of magnesium. But mo most people don't know that magnesium in plant foods is bound to an oxalic acid molecule. And the bioavailability of oxalic acid molecule is maybe like 20, 30%. And then if you look at magnesium taurate, which is magnesium bound to a taurine molecule, the in animal foods, the bioavailability is much greater. So if, if you attain the RDA from both animal and pl and plant food separately actually be several times higher in the vitamin. RDAs are, the RDAs are a whole completely different topic to talk about. I mean, mm -hmm. the RDA for vitamin D is what 400 IU. If you're if you're naked on the beach for an hour, you get hundreds of thousands of IU of vitamin D3 through your skin. Um, you know, the, the RDAs are incredibly correct in in a lot of different ways, but. Uh, 
like like I, I showed you uh, you know correlation of you know birth month with height I showed you uh, you know the association of consuming animal products and milk with height who um, you know the bioavailability of the nutrients in animal foods you know I, I feel like I'm making a, a, a reasonably compelling argument and you know even if I showed pictures of these Native Americans and these indigenous people, if we notice their facial structure, if we notice their height, and there's definitely a different level of physical development. But to, to me, you, like you and the chat don't really seem convinced in any way that th there's a correlation directly between the amount of nutrition in the diet in regards to vitamins and development. So it's, it's not so much that. It's just that I've spent enough time like looking into some of these fields to know that the arguments are so insanely fucking complicated that I just get really nervous describing like a causal link without having like 100% like concrete, like from correlation to longitudinal studies to biomechanical explanations for how things happen to actual like, you know, double blind testing, like until you like really start to build up, like it's possible to tell. And there are a lot of fields that kind of suffer um, from, from these kinds of like quick jumps to say, oh, well, look, we see this, so this must be the case, and then that ends up not necessarily being the case. Um, so I guess that's just kind of, I spent, like, I guess the only field that I've really touched on it, with any level of, um, w with any level of, like, actual digging into it would be the things related to, like, IQ and, um, to, to IQ and, like, genetics and environment, where that topic is so fucking messy, so insanely fucking messy, where even things like separated twins at birth studies aren't necessarily going to be good studies to ge study genetic differences, like where everything is so fucking messy. And and I guess just coming out of all of that research, I get very hesitant to very quickly say, well, look, there's a difference between that group and that group. Even though there's a million different variables, this is definitely the cause. I guess I'm just very cautious in making that jump. And that's why I usually just defer to... Um, I guess like larger academic bodies of work to see kind of what the prevailing opinion is. And I just haven't heard much come out in, in terms of saying that like, oh, well, you know, like an all meat diet is, is the best thing for you. Now, that being said, I mean, there are most, like I said, most of the things you're saying, I don't necessarily disagree with. Um, I, I think bioavailability in, in, in animal foods is a pretty well-documented thing, right? The consumption of meats, especially cooked meats, freed up a lot of time for humans in the past in order to, to do other tasks and whatnot. I don't think these are bad things i don't think these are even disagreeable things i guess i just get i, I don't like to jump and make the, the strength of the claim that like eating better foods will improve our eyesight and make us grow taller um these things these things i, I mean there's evidence pointing towards that i agree but man these are really 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 strong claims it, it, it's a pretty big jump but mm -hmm. i mean you know saying saying italians ate their proportion of grain comparison to animal foods when compared to you know, the Dutch in the Netherlands, I mean, what what else could you really correlate the height difference to? Besides well, again, like you got to be really careful because like when it says that it almost sounds like you're engaging in kind of like a post hoc rationalization. Like there could be a lot of things that, that might influence that. Um, I don't know, but I could spin you up like five tails right now that, that might influence that. Um, that maybe taller people did better in colder climates because they were able to reach certain things, even if something as dumb as that, or that shorter people did better in certain climates because of some reason, or that there was less, you know, food available on the ground, so they had to be taller in order to hunt, or that certain types of people migrated. Like, there's like a million different potential hypotheses, and any person pushing any particular narrative could very easily come in and go, oh, well, this is the reason why this is this, and that's the reason why this is this. When the reality is, I'm sure there's like a massive combination of factors that determine why certain people are slightly different than other certain types of people that that, that that's the only thing i kind of am, am worried about i'm just trying to think of like mm -hmm. what information i could have brought to this to make this more clear because if, if you read you know if you read weston price's book nutrition and physical degeneration mm -hmm. uh a main focus of the book is people would be on their normal diets and then when they would go into the cities, when they would start eating modern foods, their teeth would just rot away. Yeah, but again, I mean, like, that has to do with, like, introduction of sugar and whatnot into the diet, right? Like, I don't think that's necessarily just eating. Oh, but then when they went back to their indigenous diets, tooth loss stopped. So, yeah. Right, I mean, so, you, like, you somebody could, always... could have, like, a cavity, and then they could go back to eating an indigenous diet, and then their cavity would just stop growing and go away? Like, the tooth would repair itself, or...? Yeah, there was a degree of repair in the tooth. Uh, I mean, let me try to find the actual quote in this book real quick. Um, dentine would regenerate. I mean, the tooth, obviously, like... Uh, 
like I, I like I know that your enamel can can repair itself or if you use toothpaste and shit that's the point of fluoride and whatnot but I don't think that like actual cavities in the tooth could reverse themselves I mean maybe it could maybe the decay could stop I don't even know if that's true though if a cavity's already formed I don't know if the decay will just stop or if it'll continue until the cavity's either filled or I mean, this this book really focuses on, uh, you know, the facial structure and the the mm -hmm. development. It shows like after one or two generations on a modern food diet, it shows that um, again. I guess I don't know how big of a deal this seems to you, but mm -hmm. they were on the indigenous diet. You know, they had proper jaw development. They didn't have crooked teeth. They didn't need braces, and then the first. And second generations after them, after the parents adapted a modern food diet, didn't have a jaw wide enough to accommodate the teeth, so their teeth were all crooked. They needed braces. Um, I mean, I don't know how important. I mean, in this book, they also mention that uh, pigs were born without eyes if they had a lack of vitamin A in the diet. Hold on, just I'm reading for a second about this teeth thing. I mean, this this is literally like this book is literally, you know, it's 320 pages, and I'm, um, you know, I'm a little bit upset I didn't come into this a little more prepared because I wasn't mm -hmm. sure what questions you were going to ask. No, about no, it's this. fine, it's fine, gonna... it's totally fine. Like I'm like I'm incredibly like I spent so much time digging into. Um, are you familiar with like race realism? I don't know how po into politics or whatever you are. Unless I, I am not into politics at all, but I 100% understand how you need to critique every single word that comes yeah, out of a person. Yeah, it's just like, it's one of those things where it's like, um, like when I dug into race realism, my hope was that like, okay, well, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to figure out what's going on. And fucking Christ, that conversation is so fucking complicated. And like, I came, it, like I went into that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not arrogant when I go into these topics. I understand there's a lot to know, but damn, like I went into that expecting to find answers and I came out like so scared to, to make any declarative statements on, on anything related to like environment or genetics influencing some trait. Like all of it is so fucking complicated the way that it plays into each other. So anytime, and then like diets are insane. And I mean, you know this, right? Diets are insanely fucking complicated where nothing is absolutely clear. You know, the, um, just because you ingest a certain amount of a vitamin doesn't mean that's going to be available for your body to consume even if your body can consume it your body might not be able to utilize it even if it utilizes it there might be certain things that inhibit um you know the, the efficiency of it like there's so much shit that, that goes into this there, there's definitely a lot mm -hmm. to it but and i don't think anybody's gotten close to like solving any of these things where like we can say like for 100 like oh well if you just do this like this thing will absolutely happen and we can prescribe this thing and it will fix definitely like these things like all of it just seems so i get really nervous when somebody kind of like provides like a one-stop like catch-all like oh well if we just all eat meat this will fix all of these problems it, those answers always seem a little bit too simple to me and th there's so much groundwork that has to be laid to 100 percent prove Let's, i don't want to say mm -hmm. saying oh if we just start eating meat that'll stop no i mean each animal food specifically has a certain vitamin content depending on how it was raised. And, uh, I mean, if it, I don't want to use an animal example, so let's use a, a tribal example. Native Americans used to feed specific foods to pregnant women and nursing women to ensure fertility, mm -hmm. like fish, eggs, fish roe, liver. And when you actually look at the nutrient content of these foods, you know, there's a reason they were feeding it to the pregnant women. They were, exponentially higher in nutrients than all the other animal foods. But if, if I made a really blanket statement like right now diseases, we need glasses, we need braces, right? Mm -hmm. And these indigenous people and one main factor is the diet. And and you and you would try to argue that mental factors that oh they did they needed to see because they were hunting or oh well they needed to be tall because they needed to cover. Is that your your main basis is oh, no, that I'm not, yeah, and I'm not to... saying that that is the reason. I'm saying those could be explanations. I'm, I don't, I don't know. I am agnostic. Someone just said that there's no diet that is universally good in, um, and if we look at these indigenous groups, there there's a huge variance in what they would have eaten. Mm -hmm. You might have an African coastal tribe that literally subsisted off of fish, called the Neurs, the N E U R S, 
and they were known for being very tall, uh, over well over six feet tall. I think over six and a half feet in many cases. Something uh, the Maasai... that. Or real quick, something this is kind of what I was familiar with was that the idea was that our jaws today can't have, we don't have enough room for all of our teeth anymore. That was kind of like my impression. I'm just going through an article now, um, and, the, the, and there could be more here. But like basically the idea was that our heads have gotten so small over time that we just can't fit all of the teeth in our mouth oh. anymore. A -U -T -A -U -T -A You're saying what, how, how long a period of time do you, would you consider that to be? Like hundreds or thousands of years? Um, I think hundreds of thousands. I think hundreds of thousands of years okay so i have a picture uh -huh. uh, of my great-grandfather that had a drastically wider jaw and facial development than me uh-huh um so this is my grand uh this is my grandfather grandfather and then let me try to find a picture of me with my shirt on because <laughs> that's all i post on twitter uh hold on uh, I got a silly picture from Halloween. Well, here, what, what I'm curious of is that, like, is there an example of, like, modern-day people? Um... I mean, look at my grandfather, like, and, and my great-grandfather and myself. We have very similar facial features, but my face is drastically narrower than his. Mm -hmm. And you think this is just because of diet? I think this is specifically because he received more nutrition during developmental stages of his life. Like, he was breastfed, whereas I was formula-fed. Uh, I, I think he received more nutrition during the key developmental stages of his life, particularly prenatal health, uh, you know, during the pregnancy, breastfeeding. Uh, you know, indigenous groups used to feed children for a minimum of uh, two years. And some indigenous groups breastfed their children for up to four to five years. And that was not unusual. Mm -hmm. Two years was on the lower side. Chat, chat wants to see my uh chat wants to see my chad grandfather <laughs> someone said that um support uh, i'm trying to hold on the chat's going fast there's evidence to support facial development is tied to the hardness of food we eat during childhood. You might say that, but why are there babies born with much wider jaws than other babies? And then why are there children that are one or two years of age that have drastically wider faces Indigenous when they're always being breastfed? Indigenous groups also didn't have people living hard, to an the, average The hard of food argument plus. and the chewing argument, uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me when, when the hardness of the food in what we eat versus what indigenous groups of people used to eat was, was not no significant difference. See if I could find you a skull structure of Inuits. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so an evolutionary biologist, Daniel Le Lieberman, um, at Harvard University, conducted an elegant study in 2004 on hyrax's fed soft cooked foods and tough raw foods. Higher chewing strains resulted in more growth in the bone that anchors the teeth. He showed that the ultimate length of a jaw depends on the stress put on it during chewing. Selection for jaw length is based on the growth expected given a hard or tough diet. In this way, diet determines how well jaw length matches tooth size. But what, what's the argument that is harder than we eat now. I just don't see that. One, well, the because... So the argument presented here is that in this way, it's a fine balancing act and our species has had 200,000 years to get it right. The problem for us is that for most of the time, our ancestors didn't feed their children the kind of mush we feed ours today. Our teeth don't fit because they evolved instead to match the longer jaw that would develop in a more challenging strain environment. Ours are too short because we don't give them the workout nature expects, expects us to. So the argument in this article is that um, chewing things more would lead to greater bone growth during adolescence that would cause you to grow a jaw that would um, be able to accommodate the average amount of teeth that a human has. We see there are dress, and you could Google pictures of babies. There are drastic differences in mouth and facial width of just babies when they're born straight out of the mother's womb. Well, yeah, but that can... Especially one or two years of life. But that, that can just be, be genetic differences, right? But gene aren't 
my argument is that genetics are determined, but y you could probably even find a woman who's who's given birth to multiple children and the the width of their jaw decreases as she loses nutrients and, and gives birth to more children. I mean, that's possible, but, if, if that, do, but that was true. That should, be, make... that should be demonstrated in a study if that's true, right? That like as women I mean, get I older- I really the... don't like this hard versus soft food argument because children are typically breastfed for early stages of their life. And how does that have an impact? And if there are drastic differences in facial structure of young children, then why are we correlated, especially the width of the, the mouth and the, the jaw, then why are we trying to argue soft versus hard food? I just don't um, understand. That part. Well, I don't know. So Did children exclusively drink best breast milk growing up, or? Yeah, I mean, during in indigenous groups, they were breastfed for a minimum of two years. Yeah, but what I'm and asking maybe, is, were they exclusively breastfed, or were they breastfed and then they also ate other things as well? Oh, they were exclusively breastfed, and then foods would be incorporated, you know, two three years into their life. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I don't understand what what foods are you going to feed a child that are harder than the foods we have now. I think most children that are two to three years of age now are chewing much harder foods than our ancestors were. Wait, no, no way. Today we feed them like formula and things out of like gerber jars and shit. Like they're getting okay, very, but very soft foods. But what food would you have fed a child that is harder than what we have now a hundred years ago? I mean, any type of meat or vegetable. If you take meat, and uh, usually the indigenous groups fed their children raw meat, and uh, I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have had steak tartare, carpaccio, or certain cuts of raw meat, and not even raw meat. If we look at egg yolks, if we look at brain tissue, bone marrow, butter, fat, cream, these animal foods are very, very soft. They're not actually that hard. Gnawing on, uh, like not gnawing on osobuco here. That's not what they're chewing. If anything, um, I would argue that the foods we give to children now are much harder from cereal. Uh, what, what, would a, what would a child have for lunch typically? If you had cereal for breakfast, I mean cereal, I would consider a hard food. I don't think cereals are a hard food. No, 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 not at all. Um, when I think of a hard food, I think of something that requires chewing. You typically don't chew cereal the same way that you would like chew on, on something more, I don't know, like fibrous. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of like some type of vegetable that like, like even something like a uh, broccoli or whatever require more chewing than like a, than like a piece of cereal that's like 90% air, no? Like, but I think this is just, I mean, oh, I yeah, just like don't carrots see. and stuff like that. Sure. But you have to, the, the thing you have to understand is now didn't exist a hundred years ago, let alone hundreds of years ago, uh, like creation of pretty if you look at diets in places even like 100 to 200 years ago mm -hmm. you know they didn't have access to fruits and vegetables because there was no such thing as refrigeration and it was very seasonally based come from grains and animal foods and that was it uh y your choice of nutrition over the over the course of most of the year was either locally mm -hmm. uh and then just whatever animal foods you had access to Um, sorry, so I'm gonna chat. Wait, how do you not chew cereal? So cereal, so <laughs> there are things that you can chew. I don't know how to explain this, but like if you eat foods like um, even like an apple or like a carrot, um, there are things that you chew that you like really have to chew that will leave your jaw feeling like you've like had to work it out. Um, cereal is not like this at all. When you eat cereal, it's like cereal is like you like you barely crunch it and then it's done. Yeah, it's like if you take like a bite out of a steak and it's like it yeah. tenderizes it slightly, but then you got to keep mm -hmm. taking bites out of it. Yeah, yeah, like something like meaty stuff. Yeah, it's going to be way different than like cereal is not something you chew. I mean, like you chew it, you, you don't just bite swallow it, it all. But like if yeah. you bite a piece of cereal, it like breaks down. Yeah, and but you're it. never going to eat cereal and feel like your jaw is tired from eating cereal. Like, like it just doesn't work that way. The only the only main gripe I have with the the hardness of the food argument is mm -hmm. just looking at the very very young children. Yeah, no, I'm curious. Main... And again, I like I just it's just stuff I need empirical data. I'm just I'm trying to find like um because the, the, this random link says that the prehistoric diet was mainly breastfeeding. So I'm curious if um 
like a, 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 up to what age do you have to well actually i guess we can just look at the original harvard thing that was uh, I, I used to have studies that um and i don't know if it was from the australian breastfeeding society uh-huh. uh I, there was one group of indigenous that breastfed till they were like seven years old it was something crazy mm -hmm. uh because i don't know how long you have to eat and chew stuff until your jaw grows like maybe this is a process that you can do up until you're 14 15 16 or maybe up until you're into your mid-20s when puberty completely stops or whatever um I mean, I don't know how, how relevant this is. There was, uh, I don't know if it was a documentary. Uh, there was a guy, I think his name was Gail Sayed, who was on the Joe Rogan podcast. He talked about how uh, a tribe of monkeys started eating garbage out of a resort that was built, and they were eating a lot of cake. And these monkeys developed tuberculosis within a generation or two and just died. And, and tuberculosis is, um, and if you read Weston Price's book, it just seems to be a disease that uh, kills people when they go on modern diets in the absence of vaccinations. Uh, let me see if I could find that. I don't think I'm gonna be able to find that, but I'm gonna look at uh, like me, caloric chum. availability Thanks in nature and just maze. try to kind of relate that to how you would have even been able to obtain your calories, or is that? Wait, well, I'm sorry, say that again. Do we want to look at availability of calories in a natural environment? Like outside of the context of modern refrigeration and transportation, that's well, I don't know. Right. I'm just for... curious right now what causes our teeth to fit in our mouth. That's the only question I'm curious about right now. Is if if is if a lot of our adolescent chewing can actually impact um, whether or not our, our our teeth fit in our face, or if this is just I like mean, a um, nutrient thing. I mean, if you scroll through the the Weston Price book, they have just, just a butterfly one America. generation of parents following. A modernized diet of refined grains and flours and jams and canned foods. The facial structure of children was much more narrow and they lacked the jaw width to accommodate the teeth. Let me see if I could find a specific quote from the book. Because it seems like the um, the amount of chewing, this seems to be something that, because I'm seeing this in another area as well. In a report published online this week in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, she concludes that the transition of farming, which involved the domestication of plants and animals, a major increase in food processing, and thus consumption of easier-to-chew food, altered the shape of the human jaw, making it shorter and less robust. And the shortening of the jaw, she suggests, led to greater crowding of the teeth and the orthodontist bills that plague many modern families. As for whether these changes in jaw shape are due to natural selection over many generations or simply changes that arise anew in each growing infant, von Kremann uh, Tabital cites experimental studies showing that animals raised on softer, more processed foods grow smaller jaws than those fed fresh, unprocessed foods. But even if the jaw alterations were due to natural selection, she concludes they would have taken place over a relatively short period of evolutionary time. Would that, would that explain why we have a lot of modern people that still have it's genetic that a lot of modern people that have this jaw width and proper facial development without while having you know without the need for braces they have plenty of room in their mouth for these teeth you know there are modern people that have that and then there are people that are polar opposites that needed braces multiple times jaw, corrective jaw surgeries and things like that wait what's the question or I mean, you're saying that past generations were chewing harder foods and that's why differently than ours now but what about modern people that seem to have proper facial development and don't need braces 
I don't know. But were they chewing harder foods I mean, in adolescence? Were they just genetically born with larger jaws? Like, I'm not sure. And that's what I'm saying. I mean, my my theory is that, and the information that I've presented here is to try to correlate of, you know, the mother's diet, the child's diet during developmental periods is what gauges whether or not the body has enough vitamins and minerals to even form the skeletal structure of the face. And, uh, all right, um, skulls of primitive Indians. And I mean, you want to look at like, like pictures of skulls in the primitive Indians. I mean, well, no, again, this isn't like, this isn't like you're, you, I know that you have your explanation and I don't deny that these correlations ex exist. I'm just rejecting that it's, that we can say it's causal because the correlation exists. Like that said, I'm just saying that your claim is very strong um, and that to, to get to that very strong claim, like experimental data and biological mechanisms are really important here. Oh, um, so you're saying like I, we've kind of established that, you know, these people had perfect facial development and they were consuming, you know, certain amounts of animal foods. But to now prove is that it's not due to things like chewing harder food, environmental changes, exercise, things like that. Yeah, that maybe that, that, you could take two people, you could grow one on a meat diet, and you could take another person and put them on a meat diet, but all their meat goes into a milkshake blender first, and maybe the first person grows up with a healthy jaw or whatever, and the second person doesn't, and it's not actually the nutrients, it's the environmental impact, it's the actual working of the jaw that lengthens the jaw that causes the teeth to fit in the mouth. That, that could be possible. I don't know if that's true or not, I'm just saying that could be a possible explanation. I mean, I've said this a couple times already, but then how would you explain a drastic width of facial difference between two young children would you say that's genetic i, I mean, mean it could just be genetic variation what do you mean i mean there's gen that's part of ha having kids right Gen genes vary from child to child I mean, you know if, if the environment if the diet of people and where they're living isn't what determines their genetics over the course of years and years and years i mean then what would really do that though if what can you say that again if if we my my what i was going to say was if you plant italian person in the netherlands for 10 generations mm -hmm. you know i'm sure they would call her and they would start uh develop because if we can argue that all i mean saying that kind of humans migrated from various parts of africa to different parts of the world yeah uh, that's generally accepted by people. So if, if the original human was from African descent and it migrated, old, then what determined features such as our skin color, uh, type of hair, height, wouldn't all of these things be determined by the environment that we're living in? And wouldn't part of that be diet? It can be, sure. What? And if that doesn't explain it, then what does? Well, but what I'm saying is that, like, p part of it could be diet, but part of it could be other environmental factors as well. So, for instance, when we talk about, like, perfect jaws, that might be chewing growing up rather than types of food eaten or, or the nutrients of the food available. That might be more of a an, an exercise thing than a nutrition thing. I mean, if, if you had a picture of a baby that came right out of a mother's womb and okay. it had a very wide jaw and wide lips, and then you took a picture of a baby that had a very narrow jaw and narrow lips, you would just say that's purely genetic? Well, it, it could be. It could be genetic. It could be based on the mother's diet. But also, the, the child with the wide jaw, maybe they grow up if they eat only soft foods and their jaw doesn't accommodate like all the teeth that they would have growing up. And maybe the one with the smaller jaw grows up to accommodate all of the teeth anyway. Like, yeah, but what? But what, then why do all indigenous groups that were still close to their diet, such as various African tribes, Australian Aborigines, Native Americans, why do they all have very specifically wide faces and lip development? Like these indigenous groups in various parts of the world, although they look different, their facial features are incredibly similar in regards to the lip development. And uh, let me just, I'll bring up, uh, th I'll bring up three pictures of three different indigenous groups. Well, Native yeah, but Americans, the pictures, yeah, I don't, but the individual pictures don't say much, right? We're like, we're talking, we need to talk about wide groups of people, right? I mean, do you, how many pictures of Native Americans do you want me to give you? Like 10? Well, not pictures. We'd be talking about like averages between groups of people. So like some sort of study uh, across all the collected skulls or whatever uh, of certain things and then comparing these facial features and then creating a data set. Not, right? Chewing gives lip I mean, gains, stuff. Could I, could I find that information? I mean, 
I don't know. It's really, this is really I fucking mean, hard shit. Um, I mean, I could find I could find that information, but here would be interesting information. Okay, is are there studies it, on historic people that had mainly plant based diets, and then studies on historic people that had mainly meat based diets, and the historic people with, that ate more plants than meat ended up having shitty jaws compared to the people that ate more meats? Because I was under the oh, understanding that most ancient people had were doing really good as far as teeth goes, regardless of whether or not they ate more meat or more plants. Which would lend a little bit more credence to the idea that chewing things and having less processed foods grew you caused an environmental interaction with our jaws that made them accommodate our teeth more so than just eating more meat. That oh, would be but the, the constant the constant factor in all of those indigenous diets is that sixty five percent of their calories as a minimum came from animal foods. But is that is that really true though? I don't think that's true. That every true. single group of people, all indigenous peoples, had sixty five percent of their calories coming from animals. That was if it varied from fifty five percent to like eighty percent, and even some indigenous groups would consume only meat, like the Inuits and the Eskimos. What the reason I wanted to bring up the nature argument is because cold climate. The only possible way you could procure, just in general, in any climate, in any part of the world, before modern agriculture, and humans have existed for long periods of time before modern agriculture, cured enough calories from nature was from animal foods. 100, 100%. There's no source of nutrition from plant foods pre-agriculture. It was animal-based diet. And then grains started to take place, uh, a lot of animal foods, depending on accessibility. In th this book, the Nutrition and Physical Generation has, uh, they look at skulls of different types of Indians. They looked at children showing changes in facial and dental arch formation from modern foods. In the in the indigenous Seminole Indians, is were normal with freedom from facial distortion. In contrast with this, the Indians of Florida who are living today in contact with modern civiliz civilized foods, under teeth they had much more tooth decay and showed a typical deformation with crowding of the teeth and narrowing of the face, uh, conditions that have been found in all human stocks went on an inadequate nutrition during the formative and early growth period. This is on page. Just eat healthy Lul. Some young college student trying to prove a point from a single book you read. The two primary books, I mean, Weston Price, Nutritional, Nutrition, Physical Generation. Uh, you have Vilyamar Stephens's The Fat of the Land. And there are a lot of, and pretty much any sort of write up on tribes. I've read a lot about, uh, I can't remember the name of the book. Uh, I think it's called something with the word white man in it. It's a book on Native American Indians and what they used to eat. Uh, I've read a lot of books on like uh, tribes, on the Dinka, on the Maasai. A lot of studies on them as well. Okay, I'll do more. Um, I'll try to do more research into the um, into I guess like these prehistoric diets and see how much variance there was from one group to another, and then maybe we can revisit the conversation when I got a little bit more information about it. Or yeah, I mean, there's definitely you know e even me. It's just mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind I'm kind of I'm all over the place with you know the various topics that I talk to related to this. Mm -hmm. It to like a marketable kind of way so close to uh, diets people are following now but it's difficult because the main thing holding back this information is the lack of data on these people sure 
bit. I mean, you could look at what the indigenous Aborigines ate all you want. You could look, you could look at what they looked like and you could put two and two together, but oh, like correlative or causative studies on this, then you know, argue this point is it's, it's difficult. Interesting. Okay. All right. Well, Hey, I appreciate the conversation, buddy. Do you have any final parting words? If you guys are interested in this, I mean, you can read that book. Uh, that's a pretty good explanation. Also a pretty good one. I mean, that's really it. Like you, you have to be pretty open-minded and read these books. And, uh, then, then there's still a lot of, you know, even when I initially read these, I still had a lot of, uh, reservations about this. We aren't interested. I can't, I can't blame Twitch. I didn't, I didn't honestly, for the first half of this conversation, I didn't even know you were live on stream. So, Oh shit. Sorry. I thought you, I was no, no, it's okay. No, thank Yeah. I mean, honestly, if I, if I thought it was, I thought if I knew this was going to be live, I would have prepared a lot more information. Okay, no, I'm, uh, I'm kind of just, uh, had some, I had some stuff together and I had the kind of the points I was going to argue. Mm -hmm. So presented a decent amount of information that if people want to look at it, but I mean, I can understand that if people don't have like a black and white concrete thing that you can put in front of them, it's very difficult to, uh, and, and there's so much conflicting stuff too. A lot of conflicting theories on every single one of these topics, but, uh, I don't want to take up any more time. I know chat isn't really too enthusiastic about this topic, That's but, right. uh, no, th thanks for having me on. I think, uh, if you are interested in revisiting this, I'll try to, I mean, just let me know like what, like what specifically you want to talk on and I'll try to have as many resources as possible. Okay, cool. All right. Well, Hey, I appreciate the conversation, man. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the weekend guys. Yep. Bye. Fuck. I got here at the end. But it sounded like you were debating a vegan phrenologist white nationalist. <sighs> Truly the final boss of debating. <laughs> yeah. Seemed like a nice guy though. I feel like um I hate to do the correlation causation meme because we all do that in high school and it's stunned to death, but it feels like sometimes people really want to draw very strong causal links from very convincing um correlational correlated data. But um man. It feels tempting to do that, but I don't think you can do that. Hello, my dude. Is Nathan getting anything dank for Christmas? If so, this is for something danker. Tell him Merry Christmas from Twitch chat. Not chat. Screw them. Also, do you what think he'll play RimWorld full release no. or Battle Brothers expansion? Nope. There you go. There's that guy's channel if you want to go check him out. But, um... Um... If you if you're saying things in chat, so Krasix, I think you're like a really good example of this. Hold on. So when you just say things in fat in chat, like I'm triggered, this person's retarded, this is dumb, blah 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 blah, but you never link anything or like make any other counter arguments, like um, I usually just like instantly ignore everything you say. Um, yeah. Just like is it a. What do you want? Hey man, nice debate. Thanks. That was, that was uh, a good one. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Did, did, what did we get out of all that? That's what I'm trying to figure out right now. <laughs> um. Uh, somebody <laughs> so was just. Confused. Oh no, no, no sorry. Somebody's making the argument that like a meat-based diet or a heavily meat-based diet is better for us health-wise than vegetables and whatnot, and that the bioavailability of nutrients and vegetables is not high enough for them to be worthwhile. I, I think consuming is generally. Um. Yikes. Um, I don't know what to tell you about that, man. Just. What's what's unhealthy? What's what? What what's considered as unhealthy? Um, what do you mean? What are you asking? This is a very complicated question. What, do, what, what's particular are you asking? So you said if you eat bad foods, you get a big old jaw. 
Okay, no. So one of the contentions was he was claiming that um, eating largely meat-based diets allow either mothers to provide healthier breast milk or children to grow larger jaws, and that the reason why we have trouble with things like our teeth today is because we consume more vegetables and not enough meat. Um, the counter argument that I've usually seen presented, or the main argument I've usually seen presented, is that people generally um, don't consume enough chewy foods growing up now, and that's the reason why we can't accommodate all of the teeth in our mouths anymore. That our jaws now, are getting the proper workout.